All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Can we clap for the worship team, please? <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Andy. <laughs> He's a good friend. Um, first, I want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the house. Can we clap for all the fathers in the house? Pastor Mike is not here with us today because he's doing the duty of a father and a grandfather. He's out uh, spending time with his kids and his grandkids, so he asked me to take his place. So it's exciting. It's also a privilege to be given the opportunity to share out of God's word. Um, this is my first time speaking to the church here, and I'm just thrilled to do this with you guys. Um, it's not always an easy thing when you stand in the front of people that you are still getting to know. <laughs> and um, if you have not noticed, I do have an accent, and that accent emerged from Africa. That's where I was born, and so... Please bear with me, I cannot regurgitate, unfortunately, what I've said if you do not understand my accent, but you can meet me after church and tell me you missed a word, so put them down as we go along. <laughs> uh, can we open up in a word of prayer, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, King of Glory, we come before you humbled, that there is none like you, you alone are worthy, you alone are perfect. You're the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the hell should die and hell of him. There is none like you in all of heaven and on earth. And so as we dive into your word, Lord, would you open our eyes and soften our hearts. We may learn something new and not just to hear those words, but to apply them to our lives. That we may live a life that brings glory and honor to you. We love you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. I have a question. Have you ever found yourself in a difficult situation? One that seems impossible to solve? One that you've been feeling hopeless about? Perhaps as fathers, they always love to do projects around the house. They're either tearing down or building up. If the fence is not down today, they are mowing the lawn. And sometimes it can be like a tax, uh, task that is not <laughs> able to be filled up or to be completed. But have you also found yourself in a difficult situation in your marriage, financial setbacks, or maybe health issues that you might have, or even a difficult child that you're dealing with? You've been praying for this child to come to the faith in Jesus Christ. You're working constantly on them, and it seems like all hope is lost, and you cannot just cut through to them. Perhaps you find yourself in a circumstances that seems impossible to get out, some sort of addiction or things that you do in your closet. Well, I have found myself in difficult situation before, a couple times, if not more than a couple. The one that comes to mind is when I first uh, lost my stepbrother in Africa. And this is um, just so you might get to know me better. And so I'll be sharing my testimony along with the text that we will be looking at in the book of Mark, chapter 9. Growing up in Africa, it wasn't always easy. And something that might seem difficult in Africa in a developed nation might not seem so difficult anyway. So when I share my testimony, do not look at it as though if it were in America, that's not a difficult situation at all. Everything is difficult at different levels depending on where you are and what make it impossible. In Africa, if you're not educated or you don't go to a good school, getting into any sort of job is the most difficult thing you would encounter. Until today, we're being told that you have to go to a certain school, you have to attain a certain degree so that you can fend for your family. So when I was growing up and I started my national diploma in mechanical engineering, Sonny, who was my stepbrother, told me, Olu, um, 
Once you graduated from your national diploma, I'm going to send you to one of the best schools in Abuja, Federal Capital Territory. Well, a few weeks to Sonny's wedding, a few months before I graduated, Sonny passed away. And when Sonny passed away, I felt that all hope was lost and that I found myself in an impossible situation that I would not go to that school and that would lead to not being able to get a job of my choice. And then I began to mingle with friends. I had lost hope. I had put my hope in an individual. Today, as we dive into Mark chapter 9, verse 14, reading up to 29, you will find a father who found himself in almost similar predicament a problem that he's been trying to solve for so long. And this led to a point where he felt desperate and he was unable to solve this problem no matter what he did. So as you read from verse 14, this is Jesus and the disciples coming down from Mount Tabor. This was right after the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John were with Jesus perhaps overnight. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus saw a great multitude around them and the scribe disputing with them. Immediately when he saw them, all the people greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? The scribes are the teachers of the law, those who say they know everything that the Bible has to say in the Old Testament. They are the lawyers back then who knew everything. And their job was to discredit Jesus, to prove that Jesus was not who he said he is, that Jesus is not God. And everywhere the multitude are gathered, anywhere Jesus was, they wanted to be there. They wanted to discredit him and say he is not who he claims to be. So when Jesus saw them, he put the question to the scribes and not just to the people. Because they were the one disputing with his disciples. He asked them what you were discussing with them. And perhaps the crowd also ran towards Jesus. Everyone saw him and they all ran. You ask yourself, why did they run to Jesus? Was his face still shown with the glory that he possessed? when he did the transfiguration, that would be wrong because Jesus did tell his disciples not to tell anyone of what they have seen. So they weren't amazed because Jesus was coming down from the mountain and they saw a glory revealed in his face. But perhaps they were amazed because nine of the other disciples have been struggling trying to cast out this demon from this boy. And now it was time that they saw Jesus. So if this is difficult for the nine, it perhaps is difficult for Jesus to do. And how often do we assume that what is difficult for the best amongst us can be difficult for God too? We do that all the time. I do that. If a doctor tells me that you are in a predicament and your life will be cut short, we simply believe that. Instantly, we begin to react on that and say that is true. We believe that when someone who knows how to build everything, they are only the people you can go to. In fact, nowadays, people do not do research themselves anymore. It's all about what this person will tell me that makes me believe that that is true. How often do we listen to the news and the propagandas that you see on there? The news or the media has become the most powerful entity because it has the ability to control the minds of the people. The people simply believe what they hear because they believe it's coming from the right source. And sometimes we do that even with God, believing that he is in unable to do it because we've seen these guys unable to do it. So they ran to Jesus. But while Jesus was asking the questions to the crowd, out of the crowd answered one saying, teacher, I, he interjected, 
As Jesus was asking, he cut the crowd off and he said, Teacher, I brought my son to you who has a mute spirit from verse 18 now. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and forms out of the mouth. He gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they couldn't. This father cuts through all of the crowd while Jesus was still asking the scribes. He didn't allow them to even give an answer. Teacher, in the same book of Matthew, chapter 17, this same story is there. It's also in Luke chapter 9, verse 38. If you read down in context. But those two synoptic gospels did not have the complete story like Mark does. And so if you want to get the full picture of what was going on, you would have to look at what Matthew said and what Luke also said, because there are parts in Matthew that are not in Mark. And that proves that the word of God is true and is written down by people who God used their personality to write his word. Have you ever been in an accident or seen a scene? Uh, they actually did a... Uh, a survey, and they picked three people out of the chaos, and their viewpoint was different. There's always a slight difference about what they have. That's how you can know that this Bible, the Word of God, was written by people who were eyewitnesses of something that truly happened because they did not just copy from one text to the other. It's powerful. So this man came to Jesus. He knelt down before Jesus in Matthew. He said, he knelt down. He ran to him and said, teacher, help me. My son is epileptic. Epilepsy is a disorder in which nerve cells, activities in the brain is disturbed, causing seizures. Sickness is what it is. Epilepsy may occur as a result of genetic disorder or an acquired brain injury such as trauma or stroke. Diseases are the result of sin in the world that we live in. The moment sin entered the world, everything came crumbling down. When God first created everything, he didn't create it so that they could die. He created everything to live. For the longest time or forever. But when sin came into the world, it brings about sickness, death, brings about hatred, selfishness. In fact, the DNA of sin is selfishness. And sickness, diseases, is a result of sin. Whatever difficult situation you are in, in this world, is a result of sin. Are you trying to find a job? Are you losing hope in that marriage? Or has your loved one even departed from you? People are selfish in our world today and they cease to do those things. But how does the enemy do that? Sometimes we simply just point to the enemy and we say this, but sin also exists. So what happens? You see, the devil himself, our enemy, uses the circumstances as a means of torment or torment in our lives. When a person has struggle with whatever you would call it, maybe saving their money or just not spending it lavishly, the devil uses that same thing as a point of torment for them. When a person has a problem with drinking, the devil uses your problem as a, la uh, as a point of torment. When a person is sick, like this boy with epilepsy, and now we might look at it and say, well, if it was today's word, the doctors would have healed this boy. There's so many things we see in the Bible and we say, oh no, that's not really a miracle. But have you really thought about it? That the devil was using that boy's problem. He possessed him and he used this problem to torment him. That's the same way he still does today. 
He uses our sicknesses, our illnesses as a point of torment in our lives, our circumstances. And from there, he begins to sow a seed of doubt and hopelessness in us. That's how it works. This was a difficult situation, one that the disciples could not solve as the father came to Jesus. He said, your disciples could not solve this problem. I came running to them. I can picture Bartholomew or Andrew and trying to say the normal words that they've always said to cast out the demon out of this boy. How often have we done something and we just have that routine of how we do it all the time? And before you know it, you lose the focus of why you do what you do. It just simply becomes a duty. The disciples were doing it as a duty because if you look at Mark chapter 6, verse 7, Jesus already gave them the power to be able to cast out demons. He gave them authority to be able to do those things. And they were unable to do it. Why? Well, Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Two questions. Some people have said Jesus was putting this question to the disciples, and that's true. The disciples were part of the generation gathered, right? But I think that the second question, how long shall I bear with you, goes to the crowd and the scribes who were there who were always trying to discredit Jesus because a generation definitely is a group of people, not singling, singling out one person. But Jesus first proposed, how long shall I be with you? That was for his disciples. And a few months from this time, Jesus was going to be crucified and nailed to the cross where he will die. And to see the lack of faith, or the trusting of self in the disciples, forgetting that all they're doing was God doing it through them, hindered them from doing the impossible. And so Jesus commanded that they bring the boy to him. Then they brought, brought him to him and when he saw him. You perhaps thought that he saw him would be the boy. Now this demon possessed, just to show that he was demon possessed, he was being attacked by spiritual beings and not just the physical illness. It said when he saw him, immediately the spirit convorced him. Perhaps the boy and the spirit are now working the spirit can see through the eyes of this boy. He has possessed every being of this boy. And when he saw Jesus, just the high contact alone, he saw Jesus. The boy saw Jesus, perhaps in his flesh, yelling, help me. But the spirit held him bound and convorced him even more so. And he fell to the ground and wallowed, foaming out of his mouth. The spirit was about to squeeze life out of him. Seeing that he has seen the king of glory standing before this boy, I'm going to destroy what you most love, your creation. He convorced him. And he fell to the ground. Sometimes we find ourselves with children that we are praying for. And we see them even go deeper into that sin that we're praying that the Lord will intervene. And they keep going deeper, deeper. Well, there is hope. There is always hope. As Christians, that's the only thing we hang on to. In fact, hope is what hangs faith and love. For without hope, you're unable to love unconditionally. When you see a Christian who has hope, you've seen someone who would love deeply. But when Jesus, when the Spirit saw Jesus, tries to destroy this boy, took him even further deeper. 
that child you're praying for is going further deeper, but Jesus is still there. He's still standing there right next to you. He knows your tears. He knows your pain. He knows your struggle. He knows everything about you. He saw that boy fell on the ground. The crowd perhaps fixing their eyes on both the boy and Jesus, looking at the drama that's unfolding before their very eyes. They thought that Jesus would just go to the boy and cast out the demon, right? But he did something different. Something perhaps the people were shocked about. Here's the father. The boy is on the ground. He's looking. He knelt down. He's still on his knee looking at his son and looking at Jesus and asking. That's what's been going on. But Jesus took his eyes off that child and he focuses his attention on the father. How long has this been happening to him, Jesus asked. Did Jesus not know what was going on with this boy? In John chapter 1, it says that the word was with God and through the word, everything that was made was made. Jesus Created through him, God the Father created everything that we see. He and the Father are one. For the word of God incarnated became flesh and dwelt among us. He knows everything about this boy. He knows everything that has been going on with this boy. But why did he ask the Father that question? To focus his attention on the Father was to help the Father see and I want to have a conversation with you. You see, what happened that day was far beyond the healing of the boy that we will get to in a minute. The main character in that story is not the boy that is, that, that is about to be healed. The main character in that story is the father who's been struggling. And when Jesus turned to him, he wanted to hear his struggle. He wanted to know his pain that he already knew. He wanted him to speak to him. It is like God asking Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, what have you done as though God has not seen it? Nothing is hidden before God. He knows all things. He's omniscient. But when God asks us a question, you see, the healing process starts with conversation. Communication, they said, is the best gift in marriage or any relationship for that matter. And when someone is struggling, the first step to healing is that a problem shared is half solved. Jesus was beginning the step of healing for the father because in this passage, the father was the one who has the most struggle. In those days when they lived in those times, People were mean, heartless. They didn't even think about the father. The scribes were there mocking the disciples. They didn't even think about the boy. They didn't think about the father either. And the father answered Jesus from his childhood. If you look at another uh, translation, it says, since he was a boy. So perhaps this boy is now a young teenager a young adult, perhaps 16, 18 years old. But since he was a boy, maybe he's had this problem since he was just five, six years old. Maybe he fell while playing with his friends. And in falling, he hit his head. And he had epilepsy. Or maybe he was born with the genetic disorder. We don't know. But he's had that problem since he was a boy. And most times when we share on Father's Day, uh, I've seen, and I've done that too, I've shared in a couple churches, and fathers are usually whooped to get better. You can do better. And when you get to Mother's Day, oh, how we love them roses and all of these things. <laughs> but sometimes father ought to be encouraged. 
because it's not easy to be a father. Father ought to be come alongside and encouraged and motivated and also to be thanked for what they do. True fathers ought to be celebrated because this father was a true father who has rescued his child out of the fire and out of water since he was a boy. And what he displayed before the king of glory, Jesus Christ, the son of God, was showing that he was desperately in need of help. This was actually his only son. If you look at the book of Luke, his only child. He's gone through a lot. And in those days, even in my culture, in my culture... Uh, it's very, very huge. You without a child becomes the prayer point alone. It's a disgrace in some even towns and villages if you do not have. And in the Jewish community, it was a huge deal too. It was a big deal that if you do not have a child or if you cannot have a child, it becomes a huge problem. And this father has been going through disgrace, mockery. He was unfit in the community because he has a son who is disabled. He could not serve because he was looked down as though he was not father enough. Whatever predicament you found yourself back then, and even still today in Africa, is a result of your own action. That's all they see. They see God doing this to you because you've done something wrong. So when something wrong happens in your life, it's simply seen that you've not gotten your way straight with God. You cannot be put in the post of a leadership because you don't have a child who follows the Lord. You cannot be listened to because you don't have a child. And people think that you do not understand the burden of raising a child. But that is not true. For my wife and I have no children just yet according to God's will. But we can tell you wholeheartedly that in the ministry that we do in reaching out to children, we understand children and we love them with all of our hearts, with all of our soul. And we trust that in God's own timing, whatever his plan is, it will bring it to pass. But here is a father who is going through ridicule, who has been put it at a point of desperation. So he came to Jesus and he said the most crazy thing. That if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. How many times has our problems or struggle that cloud us? We stand before God, very God himself, and we ask him if you can do anything. <laughs> the God of all possibility, the one who spoke the heavens by the words of his mouth, we stand before him and we say, if you can do anything. You can read that text and say to yourself and ask yourself and say, I will never do that. And ask Jesus if he can do anything. But you and I do that every single day. You and I do it more often than you would even think. Sometimes we read the passage and we apply the application that applies to us to the life of the characters in the Bible. But the Bible was not written for those who just leave then. It was written for you and I. And every character in that Bible can represent us at different times in our lives. Is it someone struggling with faith? It applies to you. Is it someone struggling with loving others? It applies to you and I. Because there are some people in our lives that are just difficult to love. We do it every time. The hardship, 
of having his son go through the troubles and the problems since he was a child has put the father in a desperate situation of seeking any amount of help. When was the last time you were desperately in need of help? Who did you run to? A friend? A family member? What is the source of your comfort in difficult times? Do difficult times make us question God's power to do the impossible? That's a question you and I ought to ask ourselves when we leave these places. When I'm in a difficult problem, who do I run to? Sometimes I run to the wrong places myself. But we ought to run to the cross. We ought to run to Christ and fall at his feet and say, I'm undone. I need you. Some people said that the father of this child already had a faith, at least some sort of faith, when he came to Jesus. That this father has some sort of faith that it made him approach and at least bring his child to Jesus. Well, let's play the scenario back. A man lives somewhere in Galilee, has heard so much about Jesus and the healing that he's done. He's had this problem for 12, 10 years. And he heard of a miracle worker, someone who could do things that marvel people. What did you think he went for? Did he believe that he was going to heal his child? No. He was desperate. I ask. Ask my wife just to make sure I get that point right, because sometimes your best critiques are those who love you the most, <laughs> and she does it graciously. So I ask, honey, if we were to hear that there's a man in San Diego who is able to speak or lay his hands on you and say, be pregnant, and you will be pregnant, would you believe that? He looked at me with a ridiculous look on her face and said, you're right. <laughs> I'd say that the same thing is this man was not having faith, but he was simply desperate to go. Maybe if my wife was to hear that, oh, someone else said, oh, he, he does do that. He can say it and you will get pregnant. Maybe she heard it from 10, 20 different people testifying to how this guy, well, let's go check it out. There is a question of perhaps, maybe, oh, let's just go check it out if the desperation is there, but we ain't going to San Diego, honey. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> this father wanted to go check it out. This father did not believe when he went to Jesus. He didn't know who he was. He simply believed that he was a teacher, a miracle worker, one who could do something. He didn't really know who he was. So because he did not believe, you can also see what R.C. Sproul says. You cannot make a decision to believe what you do not believe. Faith is not something that you get your own way to do it or you get yourself. Jesus Christ is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one who gives faith. is the one who saves. He regenerates. He calls. He does all of that. If you have put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it wasn't anything that you did. It was all God who led you to himself. He drew you out of the darkness that you were in, into his marvelous light. He did all of that because of his great love for you. He is the God who does it all. And so this father has heard about Jesus. He didn't know or believe that he was the Messiah. And so he questioned his ability to even do the problem he's had by saying, if you can do anything. And I love Jesus' response to that. Jesus said to him, if you can believe. And some people might say, 
Is Jesus saying to the Father that believe that I can do it. If you don't believe, I'm not going to do it. Well, that would be ridiculous because why then would Jesus have blamed the disciples for the lack of the Father's faith? Well, perhaps they couldn't cast out the demon because the Father had no faith to believe that his child can be healed. So it would be wrong of our Savior to have said that to his disciples and asking this father that if you believe, then I'm going to heal your child. No, no, no. There was more to it. Jesus was not saying to believe and then I'm going to do it. He was saying, if you can believe who he was as the Savior, the Messiah, all things are possible to him who believes. Do you believe I am he? Uh, Pastor Mike said it the other uh, last week, talking about who God, Jesus is. Not just a teacher or a miracle worker. He is God, very God. And he's wanting this father to see who he was. The best thing God can ever do to any of us is to reveal to us who he is. The book of Job is my favorite book in the Bible. And what God did was to reveal himself to Job of who he is. If you can believe, all things are possible. In that moment, the seed of faith was sown and the increase was given right there and there. The father's faith was birth to life. The father said immediately, the father of the child, he cried out and said with tears in his eyes, Lord, that was the first time he called him Lord. And this Lord means you are the Messiah. I believe you are God. At first he called Jesus teacher and then now he's calling him Lord. I believe you are Lord. Help my unbelief. If you've believed in Jesus Christ and maybe 50 years, 60, 10, just now before the communion happened, or you put your trust in him right there, doesn't matter how long we come to faith in Jesus, we all have the tendency, we all have doubts. Some are just I and some are a little bit, but it doesn't matter. Doubt is doubt. And that's why this sermon is called a doubting faith made sufficient. The father had a faith that was doubting, but his faith was not, are you God? If you're God, can you do that? That's a doubt that is sinful. And that's a wavering faith of coming before God that will never have an answer to. So there is a place in the scripture, in the New Testament, that he who comes to the Lord with a wavering faith should not think that he would have anything. That's questioning the deity of God. But there is a different doubt that this father has. I believe you are God. You said you will because all things are possible. But this problem is so great. I've tried everything. Now I question if it's possible that this problem can be resolved. There's a difference, a huge difference. That is humility revealing his weaknesses before God saying, help my unbelief. I have doubts. Can you help me? Help my unbelief. As Christians, when we have doubts, it is fine to come with those doubts before the one who can help our unbelief. Are you having doubts about that child? That they will be saved? That he, sicknesses, that predicament or circumstances you found yourself? Are you having doubt? Well, come to the throne of grace. Run to the throne of grace. And ask him, simply just tell him, help my unbelief. See, when Sonny passed away and I lost faith and all of that and I lost hope, 
A certain lady came to my mom's restaurant and brought a pamphlet and she said there's a revival going on in our church. I wasn't going to the church because I wanted to hear the pastor speak. Remember, I was on belief. Oh, I wasn't saved. I was going because of the lady. I wanted to see the lady because she, not as beautiful as my wife, but she was good looking. So I went to the church. I sat at the back. I looked to the side and I couldn't find her. But the words of the pastor caught my attention and he was speaking about hope. And he said something like, if you've put your trust and hope in people or things, it will fail you. But I know of a friend who will never fail you. His name is Jesus Christ. And if today you want to believe in him, make your way down. I walked down the aisle and that day I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I quickly realized that he's the giver of hope. I made the decision to follow him and believe in him, and he began to help my unbelief. I also have a boy in Good News Club one time. His name is Desmond. He's six years old. And Desmond came to Good News Club. Oh, boy, the first week was chaotic. Desmond was all over the place with every kid. We couldn't get Desmond to sit down still, not one minute. And after a couple of weeks, Desmond raised his hand to believe in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. We can tell that it was a genuine faith because the week that preceded that, Desmond began to come to club, and every time the invitation was given, he raises his hand again. And then I go to little Desmond, you want to speak to me back there? And he comes and we sit under the tree and, Mr. Olu, it's just this thing in my heart, in my head. Every time I come to Good News Club, I do it the right way. But when I go home, I disobey mom and dad all the time. Can you help me? Like, I just don't know why I keep, it's like my mind changed. It, something changed. This little boy was getting conviction but I saw the weighty the weight of just trying to do good on him but how can I help him to realize that he's not sinning when he just simply does something bad you are a natural born sinner that is our predisposition we are not sinners because we do something wrong we're sinners because that's who we are and so as I looked at Desmond, I said, Desmond, can I tell you something? Yeah. I'm a sinner too. Huh? <laughs> I think things, say things, or do things I should not do. Mr. Olu, you too? I said, yes. And then you can see a way off of him, and then I can simply just point him to Jesus Christ. That's why, Desmond, that's why Jesus came for you and I. You can see this father believing in Jesus, but revealing his weaknesses. And so when we reveal our weaknesses before others, it can actually be the best thing we do. We are not holier than thou kind of people as though we've got it all straight. We are all broken pieces trying to help one another. And when this one see my brokenness, it helped him even listen more. And he said the most beautiful prayer after that, and Desmond never came back for counseling. When Jesus saw the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, Deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. This father's faith in believing that Jesus is God and his struggling and revealing his weaknesses, humbling himself, like we heard again, humbled himself to say, I'm undone, help me. Made Jesus do the impossible. He didn't even wait. He didn't even say any word. He did it right there and there. He cast out the devil. He cast out the demon and told him to enter him no more. But something amazing happened before that happened. 
The spirit convulsed the boy even more so and squeezed life out of him. He literally killed the boy. People said the boy is dead. And we can say maybe the boy is not dead. He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand. Two miracles in one child. And he lifted him up and gave him life. That can skip our mind. He gave him life. He gave me life when I came to him. And when he had come into the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not do that? And Jesus replied, they came privately because they were disgraced. They were ashamed of their self of not being able to do it. So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Prayer is talking to God and bringing our circumstances before him, asking him to do the impossible. And now there are four questions on here if we slide to the next one. Would you prayerfully consider the following questions? What are some of the difficult issues in your life? Are you bringing them before the Lord? In what way are you seeing the Lord work in your life? Through these difficult experiences you might be going through. How can you comfort other people with the comfort you're experiencing in your storm? It's not about if I'm going to go through a difficult time. It's all about when. There are some of us right now going through that path right now. I would encourage you to go before Jesus himself and cast it at his feet. If you have experienced some difficult time and you know people in this church who are going through similar things, could you come alongside them and love them and encourage them and comfort them with the comfort you have received? That is what it's all about. And we're planning to go to a new building. And when we do that, as people come in, it is the comfort that we have received that they see that they are being comforted too. It is how we love them, how we speak to them, how we see them, and how we see ourselves that enables people to walk through that door and say, I am loved no matter who I am. Or maybe you're here today and you've never believed on Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's the only one who can save you. There's nothing in your hand that you bring. He's not asking you, go dust yourself up before you come to me. He say, come as you are. The father came as he was, and he had faith. He was given faith. God wants to give you his faith today. Can we bow our heads and close our eyes? If you're here today and you've never believed in Jesus, you can talk to one of our elders. You can... Talk to me after church. I'd love to point to you in the word of God who Jesus is and what he's done for you. And so gracious heavenly father, we do thank you. Lord Jesus, there is none like you. You are all powerful, all knowing. You are the God of the impossible. And there is nothing great that you cannot do. We bow at your lordship. We reveal our weaknesses before you, saying we are undone. Help our unbelief. Are there fathers in this place who are having struggles in their life? Lord, would you help them? Would you help them to know that they can bring their troubles and struggles before you? And it is okay for them to reveal their weaknesses even before those children. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.